I have been back at work for five months now. It's nearly Christmas, I'm a fully qualified actuary, and lots of you have been asking, how do I actually feel about my career and life after traveling? So let's talk about it in this video, Q&A style, starting with the overarching question, how was the return to work? It's really not been that bad. I fell back into routine very quickly and very easily. I was quite frustrated with my work towards the end of last year. That frustration was largely driven by burnout, I think, and the stress of exams, but it was also driven by concerns about my development plateauing and just not feeling like I was learning new things. Now I've come back, I've started working on new client projects. It's been like starting a clean slate and applying my actuarial skills to new areas, taking a lead on client communications. Like I actually speak quite a lot in meetings now. I am much more confident presenting my ideas and managing different client stakeholders. I've recently become a line manager and overall I don't feel my career has taken a hit or been impacted negatively by the six month sabbatical, which is the biggest relief there is, to be honest. I still remember how to do my job, which is good. And I'm in a much better headspace, probably. I feel quite refreshed still. I have been working hard and I think the reduced number of videos on this YouTube channel reflects that because I've not had so much time to spend on YouTube work when I've been thinking about these new responsibilities at work and stepping up. This brings me on to the next question. How are you finding work-life balance now that you're fully qualified and back to work? It's been mixed. When I first got back to work at the end of summer, sort of July, August into September time, Things were very chill. I was working a nine till five, very minimal overtime. It probably took a little bit of time to insert myself back into workflows. I had to be quite proactive. Then in September and October, things really started to kick off with these new projects I've been working on. And there have been a few late nights. I have worked until midnight. I think past midnight on one occasion, which was a really particularly bad day. I don't recommend it and I don't think anyone should strive to be wanting to work that number of hours. You don't need to work that number of hours to be successful in your job. Why did I work long hours then? Well, I just care too much about the quality of my work, especially when I'm being given new responsibilities for the first time. There's a need to want to prove myself and for the first project that I fully take management and ownership of to be a success. So that's definitely driving some of it. Tight deadlines is another thing that's driven it. It's not just been me working late. People across the team have been working quite long hours in September, October, November time this year. It did feel weird not studying in the lead up to September and seeing all the other students sit their exams, but it felt good. It felt nice not to be stressing about exams for once. Next question, now that you're qualified, what is your usual five till nine? So, if it's a London day, I will spend two hours commuting home from work and then by the time I've showered, it's 8pm. So I don't have a particularly long evening to fill. I will cook my dinner. Cook is a strong word because I've started getting meal prep deliveries. I sit down with my dinner, I watch TV, I will normally call my parents. I do go skating in the evening sometimes, I still take skating lessons, but other than that, I don't often go out on a weekday evening. I do wonder whether I should be socialising more. I do feel so lucky to have my own space, but at the same time, I sometimes feel a little bit lonely, a little bit isolated. I think I could do a better job at building my social life. So maybe that's a focus for the new year. A couple of more long-term questions were, do you think you'll be an actuary for the rest of your life? And what are your goals concerning your career? This was stuff I was supposed to think about and work out while I was traveling. I didn't really think about it that hard, so I'm still figuring it out now. In the short term, I just wanna keep taking on more responsibility and showing what I can do at work, being a little bit more assertive. I'm already seeing that happen, as I was saying earlier. I don't know why it's happening now. Maybe it is because I've qualified and people are seeing that as the sort of stamp of approval on what I say. I'm not sure. If I stay in the insurance industry and the actuarial world, of course I want to be aiming for those leadership sort of roles. Maybe I want to become a chief actuary in the future. 
But I also want to diversify a little bit with the work I'm doing. I am worried about AI coming in. Moving on to some practical career and study advice. Someone asked, how do you work and study when doing a professional qualification like the IFOA or ACA? I think the biggest challenge is having your day-to-day -day work pressures pull you away from your study time. So you need to hold really firm when you carve out study time, make sure that happens from week to week. The senior people you're working with should know the importance of study and passing exams. And hopefully you're at a company where the people around you support you and want you to pass. I found a strategy of concentrating on past exam papers and examiner's reports was best over getting bogged down with course notes. You have to treat the exams a little bit like a game and sometimes you fail at games. I failed three exams and those fails also gave me the kick up the arse to actually put in the study time, put in that grind and finally qualify. So there are ups and downs, stay with it. It's not easy, but getting a professional qualification really does pay off in the long term with your future career. The next question I got was, to what extent does the material from the actuarial exams apply to your day-to-day -day work? I'd say the theory that I learned in my final few exams, my specialist general insurance exams, has definitely reinforced foundations that I've learned through my work experience in the last four or five years. Things like the characteristics of different lines of business and the strengths and weaknesses of different statistical methods has all come in handy. There are other parts of the syllabus that I've not used at all in my day-to-day -day work, particularly the life insurance focused stuff, the pensions focused stuff. You do learn to program in R as part of the statistical course for the actuarial exams. And I've used R a single time in my five years of work experience. Accounts stuff came in useful. You do a business exam and learn about insurance company accounts and I'm quite often looking at insurance company accounts in my day to day. The business economics module was also very helpful. I think that just helped me understand life a little bit more. I'd say the actuarial syllabus is a good one, but it, it's gonna have to evolve as we go forwards. It's going to need more of a focus on coding, definitely more of a focus on AI. Someone asked in a job hunt, how do you make judgments of a firm in terms of size, reviews, history, especially boutique firms. This is definitely tricky. I'd suggest speaking to current employees of the company in an informal setting if you can. That's definitely worth requesting. Sometimes it's worth looking at Glassdoor and seeing if there's anything on there. But at the end of the day, sometimes you have to take a risk and that's definitely what I did with my current position. I also think it gets easier as you progress and you build more of a network in the industry because you have more people around you who can offer insights on different companies. When it comes to firm size, you can normally expect the larger firms to be more hierarchical because that's how they can operate efficiently and they might have more established processes, training systems, but the trade-off is that you might feel like a small cog in a very big wheel and then compare that to smaller firms, they'll typically be less hierarchical, more flat structures. You can have more of an influence on the overall team output. They're usually less corporate. And honestly, the suiting of an individual to a smaller large firm can definitely be personal preference. Another question I received was, what would you recommend for someone in the bank industry age 23 and doesn't enjoy work? I think it really depends what your goals are. Working in financial services can be a great way to make savings early in your career, earning a good salary. It can help you afford things in the future like a house deposit or big travel. But is all of that worth sacrificing your happiness for? At age 23, you are still so young and new to the working world. If you think relatively about how long your career is gonna be, you're maybe two years into work and you're gonna be working until you're at least 60. It's not too late to switch track. It's never too late to switch track. If you're unhappy and you're not enjoying work, I would suggest making a change. A lot of people have asked me how I'm finding my commute from Cambridge to London. So I only go in twice a week at the moment, sometimes three times a week. It really does depend on, on client commitments. It has hit the time of year where I do struggle with the commute. It's just such a long journey. I sort of know that it's not sustainable. 
and I can't in the long term continue working in London and being based in Cambridge but I, I love living in Cambridge and the industry that I work in is all in London so I've got myself into a bit of a pickle guys I did not think this through in advance I'm not making any changes at the moment it's a problem for future page to deal with next question do you think you could have your pink holiday hair at work or would it be seen as unprofessional i don't know the answer to this one if my manager or the hr department is watching can i have pink hair at work do you mind if i come into the office on monday with pink hair let me know i am i am genuinely interested i guess the reason in my head i'm i'm not sure i'd be allowed it is because i've never seen another pink haired actuary and I, i'm not sure if i've seen anyone in the city with a funky hair color my personal view is that we should be allowed to dye our hair as a form of self-expression it can bring joy to the city to the working day but i i, I don't really know what the norm is and, and what's allowed next question what has been your favorite work project you've been involved in so two answers spring to mind the first one that happened a few years ago, it was a short project, probably two or three months long, as the modelling agent for a new collateralized reinsurance product. So it involved a lot of stochastic modelling and evaluation of uncertainty. I was specifically focusing on reserve uncertainty, which relates to my day-to-day -day work of reserving. Because there were investors and lawyers and a lot of stakeholders involved, it was a tight deadline, high pressure, high stakes project. But it just felt like a real team effort so i really enjoyed it and maybe another favorite is the current project that i'm project managing i'm actually working with mgas managing general agents who are a little bit different to traditional insurers so they sell these very niche specialist policies using underwriting capacity which is delegated to them by traditional insurers and their business needs and actuarial support needs differ a fair bit to traditional insurers and so i'm really enjoying applying my reserving skills in a different context and i'm getting to work with lots of non-actuaries as well i'm speaking to people with underwriting and broking backgrounds that offer a different perspective on the industry we're getting on to the last few questions i've got a few education related questions for people who might not have been watching my channel for so long so someone asked what was your degree in I did physical natural sciences at the University of Cambridge. I specialised in astrophysics. The degree was very broad, so you'd start off doing four modules. I did chemistry, physics, maths and earth sciences in my first year. Then you narrow it down in your second year, so I only did maths and double physics in my second year. And then finally in my third year I went full focus on astrophysics. It was an exciting time. I've vlogged the whole thing on this YouTube channel. So if you want to go and see Baby Page studying at university, you can go watch my old vlogs. Obviously, I haven't ended up being an astrophysicist. In the UK, it's very common to do non-vocational degrees. Five years after graduating, I have forgotten a lot of my degree content, which is a huge shame but there's only so much space in my brain and I had to fill it with actuarial science and insurance industry stuff. The next questions I get all the time asking about whether I've got any plans to return and do a master's degree or a PhD. Would I go back to academia? Truthfully, I don't think I'm smart enough for this route or that's putting myself down. It's not that I'm not smart enough. I just don't think my skills are best suited to academia. I am quite an all-rounder. I'm decent at numbers and analysis, but I'm also pretty decent at communicating with people clearly and presenting my ideas and writing coherently. If I was to focus on just the mathematical physics stuff that a PhD would need, there are a lot of other people out there who are stronger than me and it's a very competitive field. So I just, I don't think it's the right path for me, as exciting as it is. The final question, which is a very important question is, what excel function would you be this has made me think very deeply about myself and i would aspire to be one of the dynamic array formulae but i'm not sure i am i'm probably just something reliable like an index match you can't go wrong with an index match 
Anyway, that's it for the questions, for my career reflections, rambles, goals, plans. Maybe it's relatable, maybe it's interesting, maybe you have comments, observations, further questions. Let me know in the comments and thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys soon with another video and I hope you have a good Christmas. Bye.